I have a couple of messages. You know, sometimes in between series, I can't get started on something I'm studying for. It's like there's sometimes I just have to take a kind of a rabbit trail here and there. I've been doing that for about a month. I've got this week and I think next week too, where I'm just doing not necessarily a series, but just talking about some things that I can't get out of my heart until I preach it out. So I call this Confronting the Culture with Truth and Love. And I've even got a second title. Ready for it? Work for the Peace and Prosperity of Your Community. And so what are we talking about? Well, we're living in strange times. Some of you guys think that's true. Wow. I mean, you don't have to convince anybody, right? It's kind of like that author of that book, A Tale of Two Cities, said, it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. But I like God's version of that better. Isaiah 60, verse 1 through 3 says this, Arise, shine, for your light has come. Turn to someone and say, you need to rise up and shine. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But, thank God, but the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. A lady said this, it takes just one star to pierce a universe of darkness. We live in a time when the darkness is there. We know it's a fallen world. We live with fallen people. How many of you know you, you are one? Before Jesus, you are a fallen person. And so we live in that world. Sometimes our expectations of what we think that world should be doing are based on eternity, perfection, all the things that are possible in God. But in my lifetime, as short as it is, uh, it's, culture's never lived up to my expectations. How about you? Isn't that right? I mean, I remember being in third grade. Everybody say, he's pretty old. In third grade, I remember they stopped our class because President Kennedy had gotten shot. I mean, I remember driving here on a Tuesday morning in, in 2001, I guess it was, and listening to the radio and saying, the towers did what? And then I came in and turned on the, the TV and watched the second uh, plane hit the towers. And so you could just go on and on. You and I could both go on with the different tragedies that have happened and different things that could have completely, you know, blown us off the rails, except for God. He prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Sometimes Christians are hopeless and discouraged because they think, not you guys, but they think that we're going to fix everything and everything is going to go smoothly. But Jesus, who's a pretty good source on this, said, in the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. He said, if they hated me, me, me paraphrase the Terry translation, you might be in big trouble. <laughs> if they hated Jesus, who was perfect, did nothing wrong, that means it's normal to face opposition. There's nothing weird about that. It's just the way it is. We've got to learn to live behind enemy lines. Your citizenship is in heaven. Your life here is behind enemy lines. You've got to adopt a war mentality, not a mean mentality, but a mentality that you're here in a, in a place that's opposed to the God you're serving. You okay? People say, that's unbelief. It's not unbelief. It's faith. It's belief. You have faith in what Jesus said. Jesus said that. Terry didn't. Jesus said that. Well, I just don't like it. I just think, well, Jesus said that. Well, that's not in my notes, but you got that part for free. So how do we act and think about now? We live in an anti-God world. The Apostle John called it the spirit of Antichrist. He said the Antichrist is coming, but the spirit of Antichrist is here now. How many of you guys have seen it a few times in your life? All that to say that, I believe that God has a plan. I, I just keep, I kept hearing this phrase when I prayed. If you could just see, if you could just see, it's like, Lord, let me see. If you could just see what God is thinking and God is planning for you and this planet, and you could embrace that and be part of it, hope would fill your heart. Amen. I'm going to read Jeremiah 29. You guys know the scripture well, right? Jeremiah 29. But most of the time people quote it without quoting the context. What was happening is this. The 
Israel, the nation of Israel was divided into the northern kingdoms, ten tribes, and the southern kingdoms, two tribes. Judah was the southern kingdom. Uh, before this, Israel, the northern tribes, had turned against God, and they were taken into captivity by Assyria. And so they were dispersed. They're often called the lost ten tribes, but they're not lost. They were just dispersed. They're being brought back, thank God. And then Judah was the southern two tribes. They lasted longer, but they eventually turned their back on God too. So they were taken captive to Babylon. You see the story of Daniel, etc. And so they're in captivity, and while they're there, they're hearing prophecies by the people who are just trying to encourage them, like, it's going to be okay, we're going to go back. Don't, you know, raise your expectations, it's all going to change. And God spoke to Jeremiah and said, wait a minute, I need to tell you the truth. I'm for you, I'm with you, i got a future for you, but... It's in the future. You okay? Everybody say, okay. Here's what it says in Jeremiah 29. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. By the way, this is what Daniel the prophet was reading when he prayed in Daniel. And he said, Lord, you said 70 years, and the 70 years are up. And that's when the angel came and said, okay, here's, here's the way this is going to work. Isn't that right? That's, so he was reading this prophecy. This was after King Jehoiakim and the queen mother, the court officials, and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem. The craftsmen and the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elsa, son of Shaphan, and to Gemara, son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It rested in Nebuchadnezzar three times. It said, this is what the Lord Almighty the God of Israel says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters, our grandchildren, thank God. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. Even if they're on YouTube, that doesn't mean they're authentic. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. I've said many times, Lord, if you have these plans for me, could you share some of them with me? Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you. He did it, by the way, declares the Lord. And will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. They, like us, were aliens and strangers living in a strange land. You could say they're behind enemy lines. Like us, we're behind enemy lines. You okay? I'm going to read part of that from the NLT. Verse 4 says, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives. He has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Isn't it great? Joe got to baptize his grandson. Isn't that great? Multiply. Everybody say multiply. Do not dwindle away and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. That reminds me of Matthew 24, when Jesus is talking about the end times. Matthew 24 is a picture of the tribulation period. And he says, all this stuff's going to happen. There's going to be marrying. There's going to be giving in marriage. You're going to be having parties. You're going to be living life. And that's what Jeremiah is saying. That's what God is saying through Jeremiah. Live life. You are here. Live life. Enjoy your life. Be salt and light. Amen? Be an answer to the problem that you have, that you face. Amen? You okay? Everybody say, live life. life. Kind of sounds like a book I wrote called Stop Staring into Heaven. Stop staring into heaven. What did I mean by that? 
rather than trying to figure out every detail of the future, tell everybody you know about Jesus. You're always in the perfect will of God when you're sharing the gospel. Even if you don't understand what's going to happen next, if you're sharing the gospel, you're getting ready for what's going to happen next. The answer is, think about it. The angel said, why are you guys staring into heaven? Go to where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost. Get out of here and tell people. Take people with you. Some things are going to happen. You okay? Some things are going to happen. Jesus said that. The Bible said that. And sometimes a false optimism and a false hope can really suck the life out of you. Put faith in the Word of God. What is, the Bible gives you an answer about your future. But it's not always what you think it's going to be. Here's a great story. If you guys have ever read the book, The Stockdale Paradox. It's a, from a book called Good to Great. Everybody say The Stockdale Paradox. I'm going to read you what it says because it's so good. It's a concept, along with this companion concept, Confront the Brutal Facts, developed in the book Good to Great. Productive change begins when you confront the brutal facts. We don't want to because they're painful. Ah, sometimes at the church, I realize we're not doing that well. And I don't want to humble myself and say we really are bad at that. Amen? It's easier to raise your expectations and kind of snow the people around you rather than to say, we're doing this poorly. I'm doing this poorly. i got to get better here. And sometimes it's hard to face reality. Amen? The most productive people are the people who face the truth. You say, well, I'm just going to believe. Sometimes we use faith as a cover-up for truth. You okay? Did I say that out loud? Okay. Um, with the Stockdale Paradox, you must maintain unwavering faith that you can and will prevail in the end, regardless of the difficulties. You okay? Regardless of what happens, you're going you're gonna to win in the end. And at the same time, have the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they may be. The name refers to Admiral Jim Stockdale, who was the highest-ranking United States military officer in the Hanoi Hilton prisoner of war camp during the height of the Vietnam War. Tortured over 20 times during his eight-year imprisonment from 1965 to 1973, Stockdale lived out the war without any prisoner's rights, no set release date, and no certainty as if he would ever survive or see his family again. Here's what they said. How did you deal with this, Admiral Stockdale? He said, quote, I never lost faith in the end of the story. Wow. I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and turn the experience into a defining event in my life, which in retrospect, I would not trade. Listen to this. He said, who didn't make it out? And he said, the optimists. And the guy said, what? You mean the people who thought everything was going to go well? The optimists didn't make it out? He said, why not? He said, well, they were the ones who said, we're going to be out by Christmas. And when Christmas would come and Christmas would go, they'd say, we're going to be out by Easter. And Easter would come and Easter would go. And then Thanksgiving, they would be Christmas again. And they died of a broken heart. This is a very important lesson. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. What does that mean? No matter what, I win. Even if there's enemies, God's preparing a table for me. No matter what. Jesus said, I mean, think about Jesus. Perfect. Walking in Jerusalem, in Israel, he's persecuted and prosecuted by people who were falsely accusing him. Every crazy thing in the world against a perfect person. Paul had all sorts of problems, had a vision. Come over to Macedonia and help us. He goes over, preaches the gospel, ends up in jail, beaten, and he's singing at midnight in the jail. People say, Pastor, preach faith. This is faith. Faith is winning no matter what. It's not saying no matter what's not coming. Are you all right? Faith says it doesn't really matter what the devil does because the God of peace is going to crush Satan under my feet. Matter of fact, he's in the process of doing that right now. You okay? I don't quit, so therefore I win because Jesus won. So how do you approach the surrounding culture and people? How many guys disagree with some of the things you're seeing on television? <laughs> That's a joke. 
How many of you guys disagree with some of the things people in your life are saying and you want to choke them every once in a while? I could go further, but I'll just move on because you, you got your own, right? They, these guys were captives of false optimism and false prophets. They wanted to change what they think was going to happen, their idea of God's blessing. And the truth is, God so loved the world and the people of the world that he came to give them eternal life. Jesus died for them. So great things were in store. But it's very inter- easy for the people in your life to reject God, be a rebel against God. And sometimes we see those people who we think are rebels as the enemy, and they're not the enemy. They're victims of the enemy. The people that you see out there doing crazy stuff, men who want to become women and all sorts of this crazy things that are going on, they're prisoners of war. They're confused. They're deceived. I'm not putting them down, but intellectually, they're not getting it. They don't have wisdom. They don't see the truth. They don't see the reality. You say, how do you know? Because you and I were on that side one time. Think about Romans 1 when Paul says, hey, this isn't right. Homosexuality is against nature. That's not right. And it's going to cause you harm. You're going to die. Now we know you die 20 years early. There's a lot of problems. There's a lot of issues. But he said, be careful. Don't condemn those guys because you were like them. Romans 2 says, hey, you may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad and have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you're condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. Now, I wasn't into that, but I was thoroughly stupid. How about you? Amen? Raise your hand and say, me too, or I'll call some of you out, because I knew some of you guys. We were goofballs. It's so easy to say, what's wrong with you? Why do you do that? Okay, what was your deal? I preached the gospel of the population bomb. We need to stop having kids, because they gave me a book. I read it and believed it. Somebody just gave me a book about a month ago. So you, this is the book you always talk about. It's called the population bomb. I mean, I was preaching to people. You need to stop having kids so we can eat. You should only replace yourself. Don't have three. Thank God my sister didn't listen or Lance would have never been here. Amen. Or, or you know, whatever. You get the point. So the, the thing is this. All of us were those people. The prison door came open and I came out. If you hate them, you can never reach them. Amen. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't fix us first. He loved us where we were. But they used to sing about a thousand times in the Baptist churches that song at the altar call. Just as I am. Just as I am, I come to you. Just as I am. Right here today with all this mess. I'm not going to clean up first. I'm just going to come to you like I am. If we don't see those people as valuable like God did, how valuable do you think God thinks they are? He traded Jesus for them. They're valuable. If you don't think that way, we'll just get posters and start yelling at people. You okay? Here's another story. I got some stories. That's okay. I'm going to read some stuff because it's good stuff. You guys ever hear of Rosaria Butterfield? That's a name you've probably never heard before. It's one of the most incredible stories you've ever seen. You ought to go on YouTube and look at her story. In 1999, Rosaria Butterfield was a tenured English professor at Syracuse University, that's upstate New York, a skeptic of all things in Christianity, and in a committed lesbian relationship. Her academic specialty was, whoa, get ready for this, queer theory. She taught, she taught graduate studies on queer theory. She was a totally committed lesbian, hated Christianity, and was, was doing research and writing papers on why Christianity was so goofy. Her academic specialty was queer theory, a postmodern form of gay and lesbian studies. Today, Butterfield is a mother of four, a homemaker, and the wife of a Presbyterian pastor named Kent. They live in Durham, North Carolina. She's a very unlikely convert. A pastor reached out to her and really ministered to her. And it's so amazing. Uh, they would argue about stuff. Because she was writing a book, and she was just using him as, as research people. And uh, this pastor would say, okay, we've talked about that. Now let's leave that at the cross and go back in and eat some food and fellowship. So they developed a relationship. She said, hospitality and love drew me, even when I disagreed radically with them. Here's what she said. I tried to toss the Bible and all this teachings in the trash. I tried, really. 
Uh, but I kept reading it and reading it, not just for pleasure, but reading it because I was engaged in a research program trying to refute the religious right from a lesbian feminist perspective. After my second or third or maybe fourth pass through the entire Bible, something started to happen. She's trying to disprove the Bible, so she kept reading it. The Bible got to be bigger inside me than I. It absolutely overflowed into my world. I really fought against it. And then one Sunday morning, no different from any other Sunday morning, I rose from the bed of my lesbian lover, and an hour later I sat in the pew at the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. I went there very conspicuous on the fact that I didn't fit in, but I really had to confront this God, and she did. In embracing the biblical Jesus, she found herself a single ex-lesbian with a now-defunct Ph.D., the word she uses in her book, The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, an English professor's journey into Christian faith. Her conversion landed her into a complicated and comprehensive chaos. This was my conversion in a nutshell. I lost everything but my dog. But in return, she found life in Christ. You should go on YouTube. It's one of the most amazing testimonies you'll ever see. Rosaria Butterfield. Rosaria Butterfield. Isn't that good? Hospitality and friendship brought her in. Here's the deal. We say... If we love someone, we have to approve of them. Love does not equal approval. God loved me when he didn't approve of the things I was doing. There's a difference. I can love people that I don't approve of. But if your disapproval is bigger than your love, they won't come to the Lord. Lead with love, not disapproval. Lead with love, not disapproval. Love draws. The goodness of God leads to repentance, not the standard of God. The goodness of God leads to repentance. I'm probably stepping on some toes because it's really easy to get on Facebook and just say, well, I'll tell you what I think. Please don't. Please don't. Spare us all. Some of you guys need to get off Facebook and forget it ever existed. Amen. Amen. Do you think you're straightening out the world from your computer? I mean, do you really believe you're impacting the world from your bedroom on your computer? You really ain't. Zip it and start loving people. You'll be a lot more effective. Amen. In our culture, truth is being separated from love. Paul said to speak the truth in love. Real love tells you the truth. Accepting a lie and calling it love is cowardly and extremely evil. We can't project the love without truth, which is the acceptance of sin, is better than truth and love. It's interesting. 1 Corinthians 13 is a love chapter, and it says, think about this, love rejoices in the truth. God tells you the truth about you, about him, about the future, and he loves us in the midst of that. And that's how we win. Not by separating truth and love. Jesus said, be salt and light. Salt makes things better. Light makes them brighter. Isn't that good? We're planted in this area to bless the area. I did the math this week. I got about eight minutes. I can do it. Maybe ten. I did the math. You know, I've been in Warren County for 40, I lived in Warren County for 46 years. Everybody say, he's really old. I lived in St. Charles County for 17 years. Other than living in the city and going to school different places, I've been here a long time. I know the culture. I really know the culture. I mean, think about this. 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, holy moly, I'm old. There's been a resistance to progress in this area my entire life. Do, 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 I got a lot of stuff I could say. And I could give you facts and I can prove it. I can back it up. But here's the deal. It isn't just about growing people and getting more population. I live in Winsville. Wow, we don't hardly drive on Parkway. I get it. I get the desire to be in a small town, etc. But here's the deal. At the end of the day, the only treasure I can seek is the people in my life. That's the only treasure I can really seek. For instance, everybody talks about their forever home. My forever home is in, in John 14. It's in eternity. Now, I can get an until forever home here, but not a forever home. 
the best I can do here is an until forever home. And so if I don't think like God thinks about the people, the treasure around me, I will just think I want to be hibbly and go to the woods and I don't ever want to see a person again. How can you be a Christian and never want to see a person again? <laughs> well, I hit a nerve, didn't I? <laughs> I told you, I told you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Isn't it true, though? You have to prayerfully attack selfishness. He said, build homes, plan to stay, plant gardens, eat the food they produce, marry and have children, have many grandchildren, multiply, pray and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Because as this place prospers, you'll prosper. For instance, this thing that's coming up in August, the back to school bash. What a great chance to do this. That's exactly what I'm talking about. We're blessing the area. And you're not even preaching to people. You're just blessing them. And you're raising the standard. And you're just ministering to people who are around you, even if they're not ready to listen to the gospel yet. You're leading with love. And there's a lot of other things we can do. But that's, a, that's happening in a month. I think August uh, 8th, 9th, and 10th, I believe. I'll get to that in a minute. But think about that. That's exactly what we're doing. Amen? So what should we expect? Everybody say Revival. And awakening and opposition. See, did you have to throw in number three? Revival, awakening, and opposition. What should we do? Pray. That's gigantic. Pray. I mean, that's what was happening to me in prayer this morning. It's just like the Lord was saying, if you could just see. And then I keep studying the authority of the believer, the authority that God gave us. For instance, I'm ministering in Iran, and I'm going to Greece. Becky and I are going to Greece to, to preach in Thessalonica. In October, can you believe it? And I was reading in Daniel and it talked about the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece. And I said, I'm fighting the same ones that Daniel did, except I got the name of Jesus. The battle goes on, but Jesus already won. You okay? Amen. So what do you do? You love people and share Jesus with them. You hook up with the team here. We're a team effort, not just you or me. It's not what I do or what you do. It's what we do. We're going to, I believe, stand as a church before Jesus. I, I, I believe that. You okay? Get involved as a citizen. Vote. Be a citizen of heaven and of earth. I don't know the future of America, but I know some of my future. Amen? It's interesting. Um, first, Second Peter 3, I won't read the whole thing, but it says this. And so, dear friends, while you're waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure, which means impacted by sunlight. Isn't that good? That's the definition of pure in the Greek. It's impacted by sunlight. If there's something in your life that needs to be straightened up, drag it into the light. Have you noticed what's happening in the church in the past year? Very, very high profile ministers are getting exposed. We're in a season where if you judge yourself, you won't be judged. If you're hiding something in your life and pretending to be a Christian, don't do that. You'll be embarrassed. You will be embarrassed soon. You okay? You will soon be embarrassed. But if you judge yourself, it's between you and God, and it can go right out of your life. And so there's a high-profile level of exposure that's happening. Why is that? Because we keep praying for revival. And judgment begins at the house of God. And revival is within the church. And then an awakening is in the culture. we got to be fixed before we can get to them. And you can't hide stuff and get away with it anymore. Aren't you glad you came this morning? Yes. So, dear friends, while you're waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found peace, living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in this sight. Now, that doesn't mean perfect or we're all out of here. I am so far from perfect, it's shocking. I still think thoughts that blow my mind. Amen? No pun intended. I still have temptations like I always did. Do you think I grew beyond it? Do you think because I'm a preacher, I'm not tempted to be stupid and do stupid things? We all are. But I'll tell you what I am doing. I don't have any skeletons in my closet. You're not going to be, you don't have to be afraid of me showing up on the front page with something, you know, that I didn't repent of. When I became a Christian, I became a Christian. Now, whatever happened before, I don't want to talk about it. But when I became a Christian, I became a Christian. 
And I can stand by that. And I, there's, they're not going to pull something out of my closet. You okay? Now, if there's something in your closet, drag it into the sunlight. Amen? Because we need you. We need your faith. We need your prayer to fulfill what God wants to do in this area. He wants to bless this area. Don't retreat. Engage. We were made for now. Amen? You okay? Father, I pray for everybody that's here today, Lord. Lord, I just sense your compassion for them, for us. You're such a loving God. So so loving towards us, God. And it just amazes me. It overwhelms me, God. God, we receive your love. And Lord, in that love, we receive your truth. Help us to confront truth. Lord, if there are those here today that are Christians that are following you, but they're not living in integrity, they're not, there's two lives or there's something going on and they need to address it, give them the strength out of your compassion and love to change it, to repent, to come to you, and to be forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, with every head bowed and right closed, and those watching online, if you're here today, and you've never said yes to Jesus. It's a gigantic commitment. If you think you can just pray a prayer and go to heaven, that's not true. The prayer is simply the doorway into the next life, the next phase of your life, which is a complete and total commitment to Jesus Christ, where you turn away from your best efforts to save yourself. You turn away from the things you know are wrong, and then you say, Jesus, I need your help. I'm not perfect. I don't understand everything, but I need forgiveness. You've never done that, and you want to pray this. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I surrender my life and my future to you. Forgive me. I receive your love. Now just be still for a second and just focus on that. How would you live if you knew God loved you? And he smiles when he thinks about you. God loves you. That love leads to repentance. Just receive that for a second. Lord, we receive that. I accept your love for me. I accept that, God. I cease trying to be good enough. And I rest in the compassion of God in Jesus' name. Amen.